Dr. Taylor Sittler, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks for having me, Howie. It's great to be here. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a concept that you've been um, exploring and noodling around with for a while, uh, resilience. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, I think the way that we think about health these days is the absence of disease. Right? Mm. When you you feel like if, if you don't have a, a diagnosis, you're good. Mm. And I think we need to flip that. I think we need to start thinking about health um, in terms of how your body responds to the stressors that life throws at you. Mm. Um, and that's resilience. Okay. I was and, about to ask um, you for a definition and you just, you just gave one. So it's your, your body's ability to respond to life's stressors. Yes. And of course the, the catch is we don't know what those will be. That's right. And there, we know that they're going to be there and we know that there are lots of them, but we don't know what they're going to be. Uh huh. So that, I mean, that reminds me like when I studied public health, Gosh, decades, you know, in the in the early 1990s, we were we were all excited about this new World Health Organization definition of health, which was like basically something like a complete state of mental, physical and emotional well-being and not merely the absence of disease. Um, and of course, nobody knew what that meant or what to do about it. Um, but it's, it sounds it sounds like your definition is is a lot more functional, actionable, and to some degree measurable, right? Like you can sort of stress test your resilience against life, both in actuality and hypothetically. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, part of this, the part of the impetus for this and the realization for me was that's actually a lot of the, a lot of the tests that we do in a medical context are actually testing your resilience. So when you do an oral glucose tolerance test, for instance, mm -hmm. um, when your doctor has you drink a slug of glucose or when you do a cardiac stress test, um, that's testing your resilience. And this and, you know, the, the good news is that we already practice some of this, um, but I think it's really just drawing attention to it so that all of us can be aware of it and that we're not just um, doing this in a clinical context. Hmm. And, and to some extent, I think resilience is a is a hard sell in the same way like prevention is a hard sell in pretty much any field like, you know, life insurance or um, like home alarm systems or eat right so you don't get sick later. Right. right? Like, yeah, I think the, the difference between prevention and resilience is, I think, when as a person, when I think about preventing disease, I'm I'm kind of just waiting for something to happen. Whereas with when I think about resilience, it actually can tie into my everyday life pretty well. So, you know, how did you how did you respond to that all nighter that you took? Mm -hmm. Right. How did how was your um, how did you recover from that last workout? Did it feel good or not? Right. How, how did you respond when your boss criticized you last week? Mm -hmm. um, were you able to take it or were you home fuming about it for hours? Mm. Right? And, and by looking at these things in our everyday lives that often many of us want to improve. I mean, I want to have a better workout. I want to be able to recover from a, a sleepless night. I want to be able to deal with criticism well. Um, that really, I think, aligns our definition of health with our definition of who we want to be. And, and I think that's really what resilience is about for me is is aligning this idea of health with the things that we really want to achieve in life. Mm. And it seems like the, the, when you mentioned like the different things we want to be resilient in the face of, I'm, I'm sort of characterizing them in two different ways. One is like unfortunate stuff that we might have to deal with, like an all nighter. You know, I'm thinking back to when decades ago when my daughter was very young and we thought she'd burst her appendix and like got out of bed and went to the hospital and spent, you know, all night having tests. Like I was glad I could stay awake and function at work the next day. Right. But that's, yeah. but, but that's like, okay, something unfortunate and unforeseen that life may throw at you. But there's also like your workout, which is presumably not, not only something to be resilient in the face of, but a mechanism for increasing your resilience. Yeah. And that's where in, I mean, in, in the right measure, I think practicing resilience can improve it, right. Or practicing the being 
exposed to those stressors can improve it. And that we see that in stoicism on the mental side, and we see that in terms of uh, workouts on the physical side. I think, um, you know, when, when we think about metabolism, it can be a little bit tricky because um, if we think about our, our metabolic state, often we're we're sort of overfeeding ourselves all the time. So we're in a, a constant state of over um, over processing of glucose. And so that w when you when you go too far on that spectrum, things don't you, you're not increasing resilience by stressing yourself. You're you're just, you know, you're, you're kind of wearing yourself out. And we see that in the exercise realm, too, where um, you know, if you, there's this thing called overtraining, where mm -hmm. if you work out every day, you don't give your body enough time to recover. You don't actually build that adaptation and resilience. You, you're just, you're just not going to have a good workout. You're just kind of miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think building resilience, um, is important too. And, uh, but it, but it needs to be done in, in sort of the right measure. Mm -hmm. So when you know we can talk about sort of mental and emotional resilience, and I think there's you know there's fascinating um, concepts around that. Not a ton of hard scientific data, uh, but there we are getting some some really interesting data around metabolics, right? And I know your your company Absolutely. levels is is part of that quantification movement. You know, and I, I don't know if you know, but I, I, you know, I met Levels and Kate, Dr. Casey through the, uh, you know, I have a plant-based podcast. So, you know, I want everybody to be vegan. And I realized coming into this conversation, like, oh, I had this whole list of things that I want you to tell me are true, as opposed to <laughs> like, let's, let's hear what the science is. And then we can, we can deal with like what that means and what we want. But, you know, what, yeah. what, do, what does the science say about, first of all, how resilient or not resilient most of us are and how that how that plays out in our lives. Yeah, well, maybe I'll back up a little bit and talk about the metabolic health crisis and and kind of where how we got here as a great, society, great. because I think that's really important context to our resilience in in metabolism. Um, so today, you know, one in three Americans uh, have prediabetes and um, nine in 10 of the leading causes of death in the US are caused by or worsened by metabolic dysfunction. So we know that there's a core problem here related to metabolism. Worse yet, most of those people don't know they have prediabetes. They don't know that they're at risk. And about 70% of them are gonna have, they're going to have diabetes within 10 years. So there's a major problem that's just continuing to hit us and people just don't know that it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, the crisis has been mounting, mounting for a long time. Um, I first, I mean, I'd be interested in, in how you got interested in, in this space, because I imagine there might be some parallels, but I first encountered this back in uh, medical school when um, during my public health training, they had these maps of the U.S. and the increasing levels of obesity. At that point, it was called the obesity epidemic. Yeah. And it almost looked like an election map where you just saw these states flipping as, as things were getting worse and worse. Um, and, you know, I think, um, but it's been going on since, you know, for a long time, um, since before I was born, I think. Uh, and Michael Pollan, I think, has a really great perspective on this that he brought out. It was a while ago now in, in Omnivore's Dilemma, where he compares this obesity epidemic to the alcohol epidemic in the 19th century. Um, and this was a time where uh, employers were actually expected to provide hard alcohol uh, to their employees and people were drinking at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And of course, you know, this had predictably pretty serious consequences in certain terms of productivity, uh, community, family stability. Um, and it gives you a sense for why we actually went through this period of prohibition, um, because that was, you know, that was way too much. Now, the, the crisis that we're facing today, the obesity epidemic, uh, I think actually is as serious as this this alcohol crisis in the 19th century. It's just that it's much more it's been much more silent because mm -hmm. um, the effects happen more slowly. Right. So w once like I really am excited to kind of talk to you about the science, but I want to put it in the context of the narratives that that people are <laughs> are are pushing. And you know, so my plant based community has a narrative. The keto paleo community 
you know, uh, Nina Teitzholtz and Chris Kresser have a different, have a completely different narrative. And it's like, we don't, you know, we don't talk to each other. We just keep, you know, um, unloading our facts on the table and, um, you know, and then, and there, there's all the other sort of theories, you know, whether it's vaccines or antibiotics in the food supply and like it either becomes so complicated that there's nothing we could ever do about it or everyone's got the, you know, I don't know, chlorinated water or fluoride in the food or, or 5G or what, or what, or whatever it is that it feels like this, this thing that's, that seems pretty inexorable um, has become a political football and, and the cost of that has been uh, an inability of communities to sort of come together and say like, what's actually going on? So how, first of all, how, how complicated is it from your perspective? Um, like, could you know, could we well, do, could we do a the thing? Metabolic health crisis? Yeah, could we do a thing and fix it? Well, y yes. I mean, I think we could do one thing and fix it. I think the reason, I, I think it's not going to be that simple though, because. The food that we eat is inextricably linked to the culture that we have and the people that we spend time with. Mm. And it's it's really, I think, you know, the biggest thing that we could do to change the metabolic health crisis is to change our our eating patterns, right? What we eat and when we eat. Um, but changing that is complicated. I think we've anyone who has tried to help people do that will tell you that that's complicated. <laughs> so, I mean, if if I had to if I had to give a single solution for this to try and solve it, I would say fasting. I would encourage people to do 16 hour fasts regularly and potentially a couple day fast periodically. Um, that I think corrects the, the metabolic markers more quickly than anything else. Um, it doesn't address everything, but it's to me, that would be the single biggest fix. It's, it's literally just giving your body a rest from metabolism. Um, so I got, can there I, are lots can of I, different opinions. Yeah. Can I stop you there? Because sure. there was just an article. I'm, I'm imagining you've seen it. It came out maybe in the past two weeks, basically saying that intermittent fasting appeared, appeared to have no effect on uh, obesity. And so people were touting this as another, oh, the intermittent fasting people, you know, there's this whole culture of hack your body and it's just more BS. Well, so I think there's there are articles coming out all the time on both sides, right? Um, what I think we have we now have pretty solid evidence that's been amassed over the last twenty years that fasting at uh, at intervals um, is helpful. We don't yet know how long that interval needs to be. We don't know how often, um, but we do. I, I would point to the, the the most impressive study to me was really the Sachin Panda study from 2013. Um, that, that of course was done in mice and people will you know, take issue with it. Uh, I think since then we've, we've done studies showing that we get uh, some of those same effects in people. And um, certainly in, in my own diet, I've found when, when I'm, cause I'm, I'm now measuring my glucose. Mm -hmm. um, when I do fasting, my glucose stays more stable than when, when I don't. So I, I think I think to say that intermittent fasting as a blanket statement doesn't work is probably, I, I would take issue with that. I'd love to read the article. And certainly we, we don't know if you do intermittent fasting for 10 hours versus 15 hours, is it effective or not effective? And mm -hmm. that, that may be some of it. Um, if you, you know, if you do it two days a week versus five days a week, is it effective? We don't yet know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that, um, there, there's a lot of there. There are enough studies out there now um, that I, I don't necessarily believe the folks that now say there's there's nothing to fasting. Okay, that's good. So, so and that. Um, I mean, we could talk about it. I'm happy to. I, I and I, I don't want to be one of those people that's just repeating their facts. So, if mm -hmm. if you want to, we can. I can look up the study. I'm happy to to discuss it mm -hmm. um, and and see where we could, you know. Um, where there might be some points of contention or. Um, or right. And I have, I haven't agreement. looked closely at that study, uh, but you know, I, I do know one, one of the frustrations around studies in general, the, the way they get reported is there, they typically look at very middle of the road differences 
between protocols and diets. And so the people who are doing extremes, like, you know, in my community, the whole food plant-based eaters who are, you know, sort of under 20% fat and not having, you know, saturated fats, we're like, but that, like what they said was low fat was 30% and it doesn't, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like what, like as, you know, so maybe we should talk about levels and just sort of the data that you can, you can gather because you're you're bringing you know guns to a gunfight here like actually in terms of like we have data yeah and and i think you know our goal in the longer term is really not to engage in too many of these but to use data to resolve these disputes mm -hmm. right one of i think one of the realizations that the founders of levels had a while back is that by looking at your data you can learn a lot Right. And, and we know that nutrition is personalized. We know that people respond individually to different things. So being able to look at your own data really helps you understand what's best for you. Um, and I would say, you know, what Levels has done really well is educate the public about metabolic health. Um, what is it? What's metabolic dysfunction? Um, how should I be thinking about it? And then Levels offers a continuous glucose monitor for people to be able to monitor their metabolic health and gives them kind of a mirror uh, on their behavior to see in a, in a very unbiased way, are the things that I'm doing helping or hurting my glucose metabolism? Mm -hmm. So, so I, when I, I interviewed maybe a year, year and a half ago, uh, Dr. Casey Means, and we talked about the relationship between you know, glucose stability or spiking and health and one of the things I heard from some of my listeners who are, who are not entirely ignorant about these topics is they felt that the science wasn't as settled about the relationship, but you know, that, you know, we can, we can have glucose spikes from exercise and we wouldn't, we wouldn't tell somebody do. don't exercise. And so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. wondering what your, what your perspective is on how well we can, we can um, associate certain glucose patterns with actual long-term health like what's the what's the evidence there and how strong is it yeah i think i think we're not there yet to be honest there there are two there are two pieces to this i think what the research that she was talking about is that um less frequent and less extreme glucose spikes have been associated with improvements in a1c over time and have been associated with better metabolic health i think that's pretty incontrovertible now what you know, what you do, like any individual spike that you have may or may not be indicative of that. And we, we can't, I want to caution against extrapolating. Um, maybe the, the way to think about it is your HB, the HbA1c is a measurement that we take, right? And that, that, that test has been associated with diabetes by the clinical community. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is an A1c is a measure of kind of the average exposure of your red blood cells to glucose over the last three months, right? It's a, it's a measure of the amount of glucose that's attached to those red blood cells that are circulating around in your body. And so it's a very good aggregate measure. It's like GDP, right? I think, you know, GDP in the U.S. probably gets measured a couple times a year. It's not something that changes day to day. Mm -hmm. Whereas your glucose is something that changes minute by minute. And so for me to tell you that you were healthy or not healthy, by a single glucose spike would be really hard to do. But if I look at your A1C, which is an average over the last three months, that gives me some sense for how much excess glucose your body is dealing with. Gotcha. And so I think it's important to start to distinguish different types of measures that we make. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the glucose patterns themselves, you know, we're really, there, there, there are definitely trends that are emerging. And I think if we monitor glucose for days or weeks rather than just minutes, um, we can start to see some of those patterns. But that's something that we're really interested in studying is looking at what are these glycemic patterns in the general population and how they correlate with the development of things like diabetes. Because mm -hmm. like the beautiful thing about continuous monitoring of anything is that if give, given an effective feedback loop, it can change, you know, modify behavior for the better in the moment, like there's nothing you can do with your A1C yeah. that's going that's that's right. to tell you, okay, like basically like eat less of this and exercise more, but, but 
right? When, you know, there's all these, there's wonderful studies from like every domain of human existence around, you know, if you move the uh, electricity meter from the basement to the front hall, people conserve more energy. When your car shows your miles per gallon, people like, right? So that, but the question, you know, just yeah. the question and is, is this a valid measure of, of the long-term thing we want? Yeah, well, and I think if if we had to measure one thing, glucose is a really great place to start mm -hmm. because glucose is is effectively your energy source. You're kind of measuring. I mean, the body doesn't have a the body does have a fuel tank, but it's a it's glucose is really metered out in a very tightly controlled way by your body, so that all of your cells have the energy that they need to function. Mm -hmm. And by monitoring how that glucose level is changing, I think. That's a if if I had to pick one molecule, that probably would be it, and it's the one we have, so we're going to make the most out of it. But um, it does, I think, because every single cell in your body needs to metabolize in order to live. Um, it is something that is kind of universally applicable, and um, how your body, how that glucose level is kept constant, basically how your liver and your pancreas and your adipose tissue coordinate together to keep that pretty stable tells you a lot about how healthy people are. And this actually gets back to resilience, which is the, you know, how your body sort of uh, deals with the, the, um, the things that you eat, um, which sometimes have high glucose, sometimes have low glucose, um, how, how quickly your glucose um, comes back and, and responds as well as, you know, when you're exercising, how quickly does it go up? How quickly does it go down? When you're stressed out, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm one of those people that um, when I when I get stressed, my glucose spikes mm. pretty quickly. I know other people that, that don't have that, but um, you can kind of, you know, you can kind of tell how much chronic stress I'm I'm dealing with by looking at my glucose oh. or, or I can. I mean, I feel like I can now that I'm getting used to it. And, and some of this, of course, is overfitting. But I think this, this is where the concept of resilience really comes in, is when you're monitoring yourself, um, you can start to see how well is my body preparing for this stressor mm -hmm. and how well did it recover from it? Mm -hmm. So one thing that's, that's coming to me, and I don't know if this is a total tangent or not, but like when I've interacted with the medical establishment, it's usually been, you know, I guess what you talk about is sort of prevention or treatment. It's been like Delta from what it should be, right? Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm there because there's something not quite right. And, uh, and so I think it's very easy for us to think of our bodies in terms of deficits, in terms of lack. And the way you just described like glucose metabolism and how important it is and, and all the coordination that has to happen for every single cell, like I'm just sitting here going, my body's an effing miracle. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, I, I, I don't I, I don't fault the medical community too much because they you know, you want to develop things that are that can give you meaningful information and you try to simplify them. But it is I think that's functionally that's what happens in medical practice, because there's not time the way that it's set up. There's not time to appreciate how amazing the body right. is. So we just measure it and try to do the best we can with helping people with it. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't wanna like lay that all at the hands of the medical establishment in, in any more than, but you know, like another example would be like your auto mechanic. Like you, like you might take your car to the auto mechanic because something's not working, but you could still like really love and appreciate your car and you could change the oil and you could polish the fenders and you could, you know, you could, yeah. you could marvel at this piece of engineering, you know, and like, you know, when I was a kid, American cars were like largely crappy and but now like every car is amazing like it's it's very rare to hear of a car that doesn't work like really really well and and just just to come at it with that perspective that my body isn't a thing that's constantly going wrong but that if i treat my body the way let's say a car aficionado treats their their vet or or their lamborghini like that I have actually it's I'm, I'm not relying on the mechanic to constantly fix things because I'm treating it right on a day to day basis. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really like that. Yeah, um, it's it. I think appreciating the complexity and the the amazingness of your body actually can can really help here, um, both just in the appreciation and and then think about 
hey, you know, what what could I do to enable myself to be more focused or to, you know, recover better from my workout or to handle a better night's sleep, you know, to handle um, whatever stressors I'm facing. Um, often, I think when you can get that level of reflection for the, the things that you face in your life, um, I feel like you can help yourself, right? There are things that, because we're, most of the time, we're just going through the day, right? We're just, I want to get this done and I want to get this done. We're not thinking about, hey, how could I help myself achieve these things? Right, right. And, and also, and like, am you I, know, what am I, am I a Lamborghini? Am I a Hummer? Am I a Jeep? Am I Thomas the Tank Engine? <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> I'm good for something like, but like, what was, you know, if we were to reverse engineer my design, like, what yeah. would I be doing? Cause I just want to share something I just read. I don't even, I don't know if it's true because I don't have a background in sort of, you know, human physiology, but if it, if it is, it blows my mind. I just got it from a book by a guy named Jeremy Lent called the, the web of meaning. And it's mostly, he's mostly a sort of a, a philosopher of science. But he said, like the one of the big problems of the the, the emerging human organism is glucose um, fairness. Basically, to get glucose, to, like how how do the cells? If you're just like a two celled organism or a sixty four celled organism, like the cells aren't that smart. Like how are they figuring out how to get glucose to everything? And it's so, like because like there's these basic rules in which if a cell doesn't have enough, it turns on some enzyme that then says, hey, build more capillaries to me and build more capillaries next to me. And kind of like there is this emergent intelligence in the organism specifically around the problem of how do we not starve new cells and how do we how do we meter out the, this limited resource, this precious limited resource? And it was like, wow, like there is there is wisdom that has built me that I have no conscious access toward of. Yes. Yeah, I, that's definitely true. Um, this is a concept I, I only get into sometimes because it can get complicated quickly, but it's related. What you're talking about is related to the idea of allostasis, mm. which I think, you know, most people learn about the concept of homeostasis in school um, where, you know, you get sort of knocked off and then you get back to some center. And rather than doing that, we what what we see physiologically, both intracellularly and um, in organisms is that there's always a planning that's going on. And actually the, the cell or the body will not just respond to where you, they won't necessarily just take you back to where you were, but where it thinks that you should mm. be. Um, it's this, it's the reason that you adapt and that you grow muscle or that when you play tennis, you grow more bone. And these things are just built into the physiology um, cells are always planning for the future. Mm. And um, it's it, it's incredible that it could happen at that scale, right? That sort of 50 micrometer scale that where there's there's no it's it's yeah, there, um, that that level of uh, al that level of intelligence is it's it's amazing to think that it could be built at that level. Mm. Well, it seems to me like that's sort of like the hallmark of any organic system that survives is that kind of adaptive over response. Planning. Yep. Yeah. And not just and again, it's not I, I think, you know, the thing we all learned in school was it, you know, it has some set point and gets off and goes back to the set point. But the truth is that set point changes based on what the organism thinks it needs to survive. Mm. And that's amazing. So is that is that kind of the cornerstone of resilience is the ability to, you know, let's say as a, as a muscle fails from weightlifting to not, you know, to not rebuild to where it was, but to rebuild so that it can handle something harder next time. Yeah, well, so we're just I think, you know, there's there's such a broad range of physiology that comes under health. Um, and I think this, it definitely applies to adaptation and muscle growth. We're learning how to apply it in a metabolic context. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, to some extent, how the, how you respond and your insulin sensitivity and your, um, the, you know, the inflammation in your body, the mitochondrial dysfunction, all of these things influence your level of health. And resilience, I think, plays a role in that um, the 
the um, I'm sort of losing my train here. <laughs> um, it, it it gets complicated, but but I think the that the way that resilience really um, applies here is is looking at the um, the coordination that happens in the different among the different organs mm -hmm. um, and seeing how that results in a, in a planning an execution and a recovery and then and then intracellularly it's like the capacity of those cells and how they respond mm -hmm. um, so it's this is this all sounds very uh, theoretical so I, I think Yes, the the concept of allostasis is really core to this all um, being a to the, it's the, it's kind of the un, it's one of the core underlying processes by which I think resilience works is that planning and that execution and that constantly preparing. So, as an example, um, we worry about high blood pressure, right? right. That's something that um, your doctor checks for. We know it's associated with cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, high blood pressure seems to be a also a function of allostasis. So both increasing your resilience and decreasing your resilience is a function of this allostatic, your body planning for what's happened in the past. If you're, if you're constantly stressed and your, your um, blood vessels are pumping harder because you've had extra caffeine, the, um, it's harder to move the blood through your capillaries, let's say in your brain or in your, in some of your organs, and then your body will essentially, um, your, or your heart and your arteries will pick a higher set point to make sure that you can continue to push that blood through. So if you're, if you're constantly, and a lot of us are with, you know, the way that we live these days with, you know, up all the time being the, the, I think, you know, for all of us, it's been a stressful couple of years. There are all these, um, there are all these sort of psychological stressors that are, are pushing us to be more alert, more active, that raises the blood pressure. And then the body says, oh, we've kept this blood pressure high for a while. I'm just going to increase the amount of muscle in my arteries so I can keep it higher. Mm. When you do that, of course, you reduce the compliance of those arteries and it becomes harder to have a low blood pressure. And that leads to disease over time. So this planning process that's happening in your body all the time can be adaptive so it can lead to better resilience or it can be maladaptive and lead to worse results. Uh -huh. And I guess a lot of it is in terms of like, wh what's the predictive time frame, right? Like if you get stressed out and your glucose rises and you're about to be attacked and you need all that energy in your muscles to fight or flee, like that's highly adaptive, right? So oh yeah. Well, I think, I think most of these things arose from adaptive mechanisms. So, I mean, that your, your point is a perfect one. The other thing that happens in that in that fight or flight response is your body actually prepares for expected punctures, expected trauma. Mm -hmm. You're expected to get a cut or two, maybe you're gonna get hit. And, and so it, it actually revs up the arm of your immune system, um, uh, specifically macrophages and neutrophils that can deal with that insult. And by having that revved up all the time, we expose ourselves to more, um, we, we basically create the conditions for plaques that show up in our arteries. So those macrophages that are around are now secreting inflammatory cytokines that cause the cholesterol to um, kind of bind in your, in your arteries and that leads to worse cardiovascular disease. So these, uh, these mechanisms that to your point were really great on the savanna and worked really well, um, they, they don't work so well in our modern life. Mm. So um, let's, let's talk specifically about um, metabolic resilience and what, so, you know, with the caveat or the insight that everybody's different. And mm -hmm. I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think even people are different from day to day. Like you could eat oatmeal for breakfast one morning and get a very different response than another morning, right? Like. True. I mean, there are a bunch of different factors that influence that. And um, again, I think Sachin Panda has done a lot of great research on this, on the, um, uh, the circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like each of our organs even has its own circadian rhythm. So there are times when your organ is, is more productive and there are times when it's less productive. Um, and, you know, our bodies follow these rhythms over time. Uh, and th this is something we can look at as well. But what it, what it means is that the analysis of 
these patterns is going to be pretty complex. Um, the good news is I think we've started to see some pretty basic things um, emerge. Like we know, for instance, that keeping your blood sugar between 70 and 100 is ideal. 70 to 110 is great. Um, minimizing spikes outside of that range, other than, say, exercise and um, fight or flight responses is really helpful. Uh, so we're start. I think we're starting to understand the dynamics of these things, but it's mm -hmm. going to take some study to really nail it down. Mm -hmm. um, on the flip side, I think you know, people who I've talked to who have who have joined levels really get a lot of insight out of looking at their sugar over a couple of weeks, and you know, people identify specific foods that impact them very quickly. For me, it was um, Barbara's has these very healthy oat. Uh, squares uh -huh. that are there it's like a cereal and it's got a big picture of a heart on the outside and i used to eat those because i thought oh that's this is great this is a good morning cereal i'd put my oat milk in put my barber's oat cereals in. and that spiked me almost up to 200 a couple of mm. times and so i was like okay well maybe this isn't the right thing for me <laughs> maybe i need to you know shift to something else so um now in the in when i do eat in the mornings i'll do things like um, flax seed or chia or something like that. It's something that's, mm -hmm. you know, got a little bit less, uh, it's mm -hmm. a little bit less in the carb spectrum. So I, I think it's, you know, th there's a lot that we still have to learn, but on a day-to-day -day level, um, I think there's a lot that almost anybody can glean by trying this stuff out. Gotcha. So that that raises a question for me around like you're eating Barbara cereal. So, you, you know, it must be tasty. I'm sure you liked it. It was convenient. It was something you were used to, but was there also like your body telling you this is a good thing that had to be sort of contradicted by data. Like just to give you an example, like when I, I'm a runner and so, you know, I would use heart rate monitor and after a while I didn't need the heart rate monitor anymore. Like I just like my, I could calibrate my body and say, Oh, this is what this feels like. And I'm wondering, like, does it feel like that? Or is it like, oh, but I really like this food and it feels like it's good for me and it's helping me, but the numbers say otherwise. So I'm going to listen to the numbers. Um, in, I think in general, I see a pretty high concordance in what I, what I, what feels like it's healthy and what, you know, what the glucose tells me. Um, so it wasn't like, it wasn't like I felt like these were a super great food for me. It just seemed like something easy for breakfast that uh -huh. I kind of liked because it tasted good and it wasn't bad for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, th I think if I, if I got that while I, while I was eating, if I got a glucose spike while I was eating broccoli and, you know, some, some, you know, like a fresh salad, I'd be like, whoa, that's, uh -huh. <laughs> um, but, but I haven't, I haven't seen that. I do think, so what, I think what you're talking about is this, we call it interoception, mm -hmm. right? That the, it's, it's that internal reflection, like feeling, how do I feel? Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm a, I, I'm less of a runner today than I used to be, but I've never really had to use heart rate monitors or, um, I can usually tell my, because I've been doing it so long, I can tell my pace within about 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. Like, is it a 7.30 pace or an eight, eight minute pace? Or, um, And it always seemed funny to me that people would use their heart rate to determine how, how much they would push themselves. Because to me, I'd been thinking, I'd been feeling how how much energy i have left based on how much i push myself since i was eight mm. or nine right like so it's i think these things can be really helpful to a point and then you can start to internalize them and glucose glucose to me is a little harder to feel than like your exertion level or um it, or your heart rate like i can feel my heart yeah. rate pretty easily yeah. right but my glucose level I've, I've had some folks tell me that when they get spikes they can feel kind of tingly mm like a tingly sensation or a warm sensation. Um, I think some people get a little bit hyper, certainly in, in kids who have eaten sugar, sometimes you'll see them, you know, bounce a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, but in general, I've, I've found it hard to intuit my glucose level. Uh -huh. um, I think, I think, my, I mean, what I, what I do though, is I don't, I don't actually monitor my glucose all the time. I'll do it for a little while and kind of optimize my diet. And then I'll take it off and I'll just use the things that I learned uh -huh. and then I'll come back to it in a month or so. Yeah. 
So I, I think there there is congruence there between what you feel and, and uh-huh. um, what you measure. And I'm wondering, you know, and this is pro- you know speculative and beyond the realm of, of, of knowability, I suppose. But when I think about like our evolutionary heritage, there really was no need for the body to be able to assess like the effects of a Snickers bar, <laughs> right? Like, they no. Don't, like, <laughs> no, in general, I, I think the opposite, right? We, we grew up as a species not having nearly enough food. And I think all of us used to go days, sometimes weeks without food. And now we have completely the opposite problem where we have these highly nutri- um, calorie packed uh, things that we eat all the time. And so we're, in a sense, we're dealing with a problem that we never had. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I, you know, when, when you said like, you know, the, the number one thing I would do is intermittent fasting. And we talked about that right after talking about prohibition. I was kind of thinking you might say, like, let's do junk food prohibition. Right. Like, what if we could, oh. what if we could only <laughs> eat foods that, you know, that, that were, you know, unprocessed or hadn't been made in giant factories or didn't have added, you know, fats, sugars, uh, white yeah. carbs. I think that would go a long way. Um, I mean, I, I think a, a, a core reason that we're in this metabolic health crisis is that we are eating those processed foods that concentrate the calories in ways that we never experienced it. Whether it's drinking calories, I think drinking them through soda, for instance, is a major issue because you can just pack them in really fast. Um, or it's the um, the processing of um, wheat uh, or and corn, uh, corn specifically, that's enabled us to have sweeteners that are just, you know, they just weren't around evolutionarily. Mm-hmm. So do you have, um, you know, the, there's the, like the carb, c- carbohydrate insulin thesis, right, that I see, you know, people willing to die for on Twitter. <laughs> Um, so it feels like you're, you're sort of, you know, a good faith, uh, participant in, in the discussion. So from, from the plant-based vegan community, the party line is that intramyocellular fat, um, that comes from eating saturated fats and, and fatty foods and animal products in particular gunks up our cells. And so we become insulin resistant and... Mm-hmm. Therefore, any like that keto is kind of a cheat to just never test like we don't eat any carbohydrates. So we never actually test the system. And then there is the uh, the opposing view, which I don't understand as well or can't can't I can't um, represent as well. But basically saying that glucose spikes in and of themselves are bad and that's the problem. And so if we simply avoid eating those foods that spike our glucose, it doesn't matter what our insulin resistance is because the game is blood glucose and not insulin resistance per se. And I'm wondering, first of all, have I, have I represented those reasonably fairly and accurately? And what's the, what's the, how can we resolve those? Yeah, I, I think, I think each of those is describing a piece of the puzzle. Actually, I, I, those are it's it's fair. I'm not a I'm definitely not an expert on the um, fat causing, you know, uh, insulin resistance through the um, through like cellular modification. That's so I'd have to look into that a little bit more. I mean, my my take is there's a lot of focus these days on mitochondrial dysfunction, mm-hmm. um, which comes from a bunch of different places. An excess fat might contribute, but I think there are a bunch of contributions there. So some of that, I I guess I I can't fully comment on whether those are the the party arguments Mm. because I'm still getting to know the parties, if that's fair. Um, What I, well, I'd I'd rather hear from you is based on what you know, what, what, what are the, what are the mechanisms? I, you know, I don't need you to square the circle for for these two fighting groups, but just like, what, what do you see? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the, the important mechanisms here um, that, that dictate your insulin resistance, the amount of glucose that shows up in your system uh, as well as how well your body, your resilience. I mean, I think it is how well your body responds to stressors and your, your risk of disease. Um, so there, they're both, there are two types of issues here. There are in, there are cell, 
issues that affect the cellular competence. Um, so things that gunk up the cells, right? Whether it's, um, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, we know is a big one. Um, there are, uh, there are a bunch of, you know, we know that we need uh, certain vitamins and cofactors in order for our cells to function optimally. Um, and the B vitamins have had a light shine on them. Um, people have talked a lot about micronutrients, and I'm still learning a bit about that. But, you know, basically having the right building blocks for your cells is really important. Um, there's one more camp on the intracellular that I think is important to note here. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the longevity space, but um, the basically NAD pathways, sirtuin function, AMPK, um, as, and mTOR all contribute to how well your body and, and your cells are able to carry out their program, mm -hmm. right? It, it impacts the methylation pattern on those cells and impacts your, your biological age, which is, you know, your, your cells aging. And, um, and then, so there, that's the intracellular stuff. And then if you look at what's important uh, intercellularly, there is trash collection in the body. So amyloid plaques that form in the brain and in some of the organs, um, you know, sugar metabolism, cleaning that up, cleaning that out. Uh, and then there's also what we talked about before, which is coordination among the different organs. And that's things like insulin resistance and inflammation and how much, how many of these uh, macrophages and inflammatory cells you have in the body and what they're doing. So there, there really are a bunch of different things that contribute to your overall health. And I think each of these way, each of these diets impacts the inflammation, the um, cellular coordination, your um, trash collection, as well as your intracellular function in different ways. Um, the, I think the keto diet has been effective in showing that if, if we just reduce carb load, we get some benefits out of that, right? Is keto the absolute optimal way to do it? I don't know, right? I think plant-based diets and veganism have shown that by providing the right set of nutrients to the body, you're going to have better cellular function. And I think that those, those nutrients also can help balance the immune system, balance the autonomic system. So you, it also helps with some of those intercellular components, mm -hmm. how the body coordinates itself. Um, and I, the way that I think about each of these camps is what, what is the thing that they do best, right? What's the salient thing that they're showing us? And, you know, I think, so, um, Game Changers was the thing that convinced me to try out veganism, right? When I saw a bunch of athletes saying that they felt that veganism was giving them an edge, uh -huh. that tells me something, uh -huh. right? So I think, you know, to, to me, that was really helpful. Um, with keto, I think there are a ton of studies coming out now. I don't know what the right concentration of fat is. I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a believer, but I, I do see that the removal of carbohydrates seems to have a lot of beneficial effects in terms of your body's ability to uh, process and, and, and maintain glucose. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, you know, an another um, element of our camp is that, you know, be, I, I think it's um, related to the fact that when you tell someone you're vegetarian, the first thing you're going to say is, where do you get your protein? And so we and I've participated in the writing of a book that basically said, don't worry about protein. It's in everything. It's really hard to be protein deficient. We don't see protein deficiency. At the same time, I'm seeing a lot of sort of new, uh, a new generation of vegan doctors and researchers saying, actually, we want a lot more protein. And, and huh. even, you know, and we can do it on a vegan diet, you know, really focusing on the beans and the lentils um, and the tofu and, and the greens and really cutting down on you know, the kind of foods that we told people that you can just eat ad libitum, you know, potatoes and um, whole grain pastas and brown rice and things like that. Um, so I'm just, you know, and, you know, a lot of people are losing their shit, honestly, for like, you know, I love this doctor <laughs> and he saved my life, but he says, you know, no oil. And this other person is saying, actually, it appears that, all, you know, olive oil is actually related to better metabolic, like, um, what what is is there a is there something you can say that would kind of be a baseline for like here's what we know about diet and it, it's not necessarily totally aligned with one camp or the other but here are here are some facts that even if you're not doing glucose monitoring that would probably get you 
better results than if you didn't do them? To be honest, I'm I'm not. I haven't I haven't been in the trenches enough to be able to speak to that well. I would say, you know, if if I were if if I were more like Casey and I had had a practice and I had been seeing thousands of patients, I could tell you what I learned from them. But theoretically, I don't have a great answer there. My my hope is that we're going to start to monitor things beyond glucose that will allow us to give us an idea of how fat metabolism is working, potentially how protein metabolism is working, and what the other signaling issues are that are going on mm -hmm. so that we can help guide people in terms of their mm -hmm. diet. And I, th I, I hope that by essentially shining a light on this, we'll learn over a longer period of time, but I don't right now. I mean, the things that I can say are, um, you know, we, we know that things have a circadian rhythm and you go through periods of growth and you go through periods of kind of, uh, ideally you also have periods where you're eating less or there, there are periods of catabolism, mm -hmm. periods where you're, you're not. Uh, ingesting new things and that enables your body to renew itself and i would guess that during those periods of growth proteins are are really helpful so um you know maybe it's in the springtime for you or maybe it's i mean people don't really think about having these this periodicity in their life but when the body is trying to grow having access to that excess protein is really helpful to enable the you know new cellular growth, new structures to be built, collagen, all of that stuff, you you need the the building blocks um, when you're when you're recovering. And I think any surgeon will tell you that you know post surgical diets are are almost universally high in protein because your body has a lot to recover from and rehabilitate for. So I think it's important to think about what what you're personally trying to achieve in your life if you're in more of a, an anabolic state where you're building muscle, you're, you're trying to grow and, and um, you're, you know, you're, you're sort of, um, yeah, you're growing, then I think more protein is really helpful. If you're in a more catabolic state in general, or just a maintenance phase, then maybe it's not so important. Mm. What, one thing that, that, uh, that comes to me is that when, like resilience and periodicity seem very tightly linked. It just, just in terms of like evolutionarily, like we, you know, like periodicity is just a concept for us, for most of us these days, right? Like my house is the same temperature all the time. I have electric lights. I get the right. same amount of light. I can get strawberries in December, right? Like I'm, I feel like my body is totally divorced from the natural periods of boom and bust, of, of opportunity and threat. And, you know, we kind of have to create that artificially, like you create artificial challenge by going for a run. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, to some extent, I think if we just if we just paid more attention, um, we would get steeped in that periodicity again because it's all around us. I mean, mm -hmm. springtime's still here. Summer's Summer's not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, now there is climate change, and yeah. <laughs> we're we're influencing those things, but but they're they're there. Uh, I think we've just kind of we've built a society that doesn't pay attention to them. To your point, we go out and get strawberries in December, um, and so maybe it's doing things like you know just g going to the farmers market and getting what people produce locally, or um, you know just simplifying a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, can be helpful and yeah yeah i don't know but but it's a that's a that's a neat point well and i think you know i think when you talked about earlier about how hard it is to get people to change behavior like no self-respecting paleolithic human would have passed up a ripe fruit <laughs> right and, and our ripe fruit are right. the snickers bars at the counter of home depot at the checkout counter yes Right. Like we have we have to be yeah. unnatural in our psychology to approach naturalness in our biology. Yeah, that's right. I think we've, th you know, basically through, um, you know, through the, the, the advertising and, and commercial environment that we've created, we've we've essentially hijacked those those pathways mm -hmm. to get people food, to, to, to convince people to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think, um, you know, the, 
some of these it it sort of goes along with fasting and catabolism and things like that but but taking a um you know taking a break from your phone for six hours or taking a break from you know sort of your daily routine for a week um by just even having a staycation can have pretty profound effects right just kind of changing your environment for a little mm. while yeah well, it'd, be, it'd be cool if we could you know apply like uh, glu continuous glucose monitoring to cultures in, in addition to individuals. <laughs> That's neat. Yeah, so so seeing what the patterns are, for instance, in cities versus in the countryside. Yeah, or let's say, um, you know, um, work in, in, in France versus Japan. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fascinating. Wow, yeah, I really hope we can do that. <laughs> I mean, we'll we'll start to do that hopefully on a, um, you know, within the U.S. within the next year or mm -hmm. so, which will be interesting. You know, just uh -huh. kind of collecting more mass data, um, then being able to compare different countries. You know, there's it. It kind of reminds me of that they have a happiness mm -hmm. index, right? That which which they assign to each country. We could have a a, a glycemic index. <laughs> <laughs> what's the what's the con the country's glycemic index? What's the what's the average spike like? What's the, you know, can we infer a stress level from, uh, glucose data? That'd be cool. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about levels, and so because you know we've been Great. we've been alluding to it. Um, so I did I did a couple weeks of of monitoring. A while back, I think the, the the system has changed a little bit. I think I remember reading one of the press releases that you don't have to hold the phone up to your shoulder, or or, or there's it's easier to gather data now. Tell like what describe we're, we're, like levels right now, and and who might be interested in in taking advantage of it. Yeah, I think you know anybody that's interested in how food affects their health should should think about using levels. It's I think being able to see your glucose and and how that core energy uh, substrate that that core energy molecule in your body responds um, is is really helpful for most people who are trying to improve their health. And um, it it the way I think about it is levels is really about trying to give people a mirror to see how their behavior impacts them. The um, functionally it's it's fairly similar. Uh, right now, the there's still we're still using the the same sensor. Um, you still have to scan the phone at the moment, although we do expect that to change soon. Okay. Um, what's changed, I think, is um, we we've gotten much better at enabling people to capture their behavior and and then overlay that on top of the glucose data, so they can start to see. You know, you can take a picture of what you were eating, or it's easier to record your workout. You can import your Apple Health data if you wear a watch, um, so you can start to see the correlations. Because that's really, I think, the most important thing to develop a good mirror and to get that sense of interoception that you were talking about before, where this data can really enhance your understanding. Um, is uh, so. That's what I think levels has really improved is that ability to record your behavior um, in concert with your uh, glucose. Gotcha. And, and if people are interested, can do they need a prescription? Can they just sign up? Nope. They can go. They can just go to levels. Uh, no, nope, levelshealth.com and and sign up. Uh, right now, there's a waiting list. Um, let me see. Um, yeah. The so levelshealth.com has the um, the waiting list. We're at levels on Twitter. And um, there's a there's a really great blog that I encourage anybody who's interested in this to go check out. Um, so levelshealth.com slash blog. Um, there's a bunch of information there about metabolic health and how important it is. Awesome. And so as, as, as you said, like we can argue this all day, but there's something nice about data. Yeah, yeah I love using data to resolve disputes. <laughs> yeah, although, you know, I, I was... Uh... Remembering, like, there's a scene in uh, the Marx Brothers movie Duck Soup, where Chico is um, has dressed up like like Groucho, and Margaret Dumont sa says to him, "But you just left. You're, you know, I just I saw you leave with my own eyes." And he goes, "Who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> 
I think we, you know, we, we, we need, nice. we need cultural shifts as well as data to, to really um, take advantage of the, of the insights. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. No, to, in order for us to be able to solve this metabolic health crisis, it's a, it's a cultural change. Um, I would say even more than a data change. The data is clear enough mm -hmm. now. It's, it's now engaging people at the cultural level. Right. But, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that helped me when I was wearing levels wasn't so much that I was learning so much, but it was more like, you know, there's instant gratification eating a piece of chocolate. And now there was instant gratification in terms of the number. <laughs> like it was just, mm. it, it, was, it was just interfering at a very useful moment for me psychologically. Like I don't want to, eat this piece of chocolate and two minutes later or five or 10 minutes later, get a bad score. Like, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of psychology. Yeah, to that's it. really powerful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Being a and being able to see it allows you to optimize yeah. it. That's a really great yeah. point. So what's uh, what are you up to now? What are you, what are the research questions that you're looking to answer? What's what, what, what are you looking forward to professionally in the coming year? Yeah, the um, well, there are a few things. I think one, what we're trying to do is um, potentially build a, a set of tools to accelerate metabolic health research, um, and that will hopefully make research easier overall. Um, and then we have a bunch of great collaborators that we've already started working with um, that are about, you know, some of those studies are getting close to being done. We're learning about paradoxical glucose response. We're learning about what's that, you know, using continuous glucose. The, so some people have this unusual spike, um, even even in uh, usual unusual spike in glucose, even under a normal mm. diet or in, in normal situations. And we're trying to tease out why that is. What what are the function? What are the factors that influence it? Um, separately, there's uh, a bunch of work going on looking at um, for some of these diet programs that have developed. Is continuous glucose monitoring useful? to help people improve their response. And a lot of it, I think, is uh, you alluded to here that understanding having your, your glucose on and, and not wanting it to spike um, really helps people to adhere to some of these programs. So that's really neat. And then, um, yeah, I, well, there's a there are a couple of summaries that we have on the site. We, we did a summary of our uh, 2021 research year, and I'm looking forward to getting all that out more. So we have a few big studies that are planned and some existing ones that we're finishing that I'm really excited about. And there'll be a lot more to come on that soon. Awesome. And anything I haven't asked about that I should have? No, no, I think we had a, this was a great discussion of a whole bunch of different things. And, and I really appreciate you um, thinking about this and taking the time to dig into metabolic health and resilience. Oh, it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take this discussion in my head into, uh, you know, the broader definitions of resilience, because it feels like there's a lot of connections with mental resilience and spiritual resilience and um, be, beyond the metabolic. Yes. Yeah, I think, I, I think so. Yeah. Cool. Dr. Taylor Sittler, thank you so much for explaining things so well. I, I, especially thank you for saying, I don't know when you didn't know. That's like <laughs> wonderful. And it, uh, you know, it's just like credibility through the roof. So thank you for that. And oh, my, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much for, for your time, for your perspective. Um, I really, it was, it was fun to explore this together. Awesome. Th th yeah. Thanks again. Have a great day and uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime.